Yes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this seminar, Nanotechnology in Photovoltaics in Search of the Elusive Concept of Density of States. My name is David Fuertes from the Institute of Solar Energy in Madrid. And um, today I will be talking about why and how nanotechnology is expected to improve efficiency and to reduce the cost of current photovoltaic devices. And we will find out also that the way nanotechnology is expected uh, to perform such improvements is uh, related with a fairly simple concept, which is the density of the state. So the internal electronic structure of these um, tiny structures. I will use two examples to illustrate this. I will refer uh, in a large part, large part of the presentation to the absorption processes um, taking place in nanostructures. And also uh, I will devote a few slides to uh, few specific cases of entropic losses related to the density of the structure as well. <clears throat> Actually, the uh, concepts of nanotechnology and uh, uh, photovoltaics as we understand it at the moment are not that new uh, at all. Uh, actually, the, the birth of nanotechnology is currently associated with Daniel Stolfan and Richard Feynman in Caltech in 1959. And the paradigm of a photovoltaic device is probably the classical paper by Schocke and Kweiser uh, when they calculated maximum theoretical efficiencies of, um, of conventional solar cells. Uh, this, is, uh, this was done back in 1961. So we're actually talking of, of uh, concepts which are fairly half a century old. Uh, and I want to bring your attention to this point because we to think this is a fashionable topic, a current hot topic or a trending topic nowadays, but in fact it has been around for a few years. Already. So just uh, let me uh, say a few words about the importance of nanotechnology. It's certainly not a fascinating research topic involving a number of people working on it, but probably more important is the transversal industry, industrial sector already, involving a variety of fields worldwide like telecommunications, medicine, food or material sciences, and of course, it's uh, deeply embedded into the electronics, a number of different branches. Furthermore, according to the European Commission, nanotechnology has been uh, labeled as a key enabling technology, which means that this uh, technology has a direct impact on the welfare of society. And uh, recently, the United States celebrated the first National Day of Technology, which uh, also um, says something about the importance of this technology. There is a, a, a nano fever, if you like to use this expression, also in portable takes. And the reason for that is that nanotechnology is seen as a promising path to improve efficiency. I want to bring your attention to this paper by Kweiser himself. Just a few years ago, he already pointed out about the appealing combining nano and photovoltaics. So again, I will be saying nothing uh, really new, but something that uh, important people say before. So why better efficiency? Why are we interested in improving the efficiency of our devices? Well, the, the reason is actually twofold. If you like, um, from a purely academic perspective, the goal of approaching the ideal operation of any device is certainly a clean enough. But also from the industry, the goal of reducing production cost involves an improvement in the efficiency of the product, especially when uh, large production is foreseen. Okay, and this is of course not just uh, limited to photovoltaic devices, but to any kind of commercial product. All of you know this chart. I will not say much about that. I just uh, mention that uh, the current status shows us uh, increasing slope in the in efficiency improvement over the last few years. And also I want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, we can already with photovoltaic devices operate clearly above some 40% efficiency, which is a, a really respectable number. In fact, our best solar cells show significantly higher efficiencies than typical numbers of thermal and nuclear plants, which are normally operating at around some 30% efficiency. The point is, efficiency is not the only parameter important to determine the entering of a technology into the energy uh, production, 
but also costs are equally important in terms of massive uh, entrance of any brand new technology. So cost and effective, uh, cost and efficiency are the key parameters determining and um, uh, important to evaluate the impact of different technologies. There are some differences between them. Cost, in principle, is an extensive parameter in the sense that more cells or larger ones would imply, in principle, higher costs, whereas efficiency can be uh, characterized as an intensive parameter, which simply means that more cells or larger ones does not necessarily imply higher efficiency. So in order to make fair comparison, we need a, some sort of metric. We need a, a figure of merit in order to compare different technologies among portable take devices, but also when you like to compare portable takes with uh, energy sources. As a matter of fact, we use the euro per watt peak or dollar per watt peak as a metric. And the interesting point here is that efficiency does not appear explicitly in this figure. And so it enters uh, this metric in an indirect way. And the, the question is, if, um, not, not only if, uh, to understand how these intensive um, parameter affect that me the, the number of the metric, but also, for instance, if it is possible that using this metric, we end up comparing different technologies differing both in efficiencies and prices, costs, but uh, sharing the same value of our metric. And the answer is yes. And in order to discuss this a little bit, Father, um, I find this classical chart very uh, helpful. It help us translating uh, cost per unit area into cost per unit watt peak. Okay, so if we know the input energy in our devices, and we know the efficiency at which our devices are operating. We can transfer cost per unit area into cost per unit power, and this is what is reflected in this chart. So here we have uh, efficiency over cost per unit area. We have translated this into this line showing a cost per watt peak. We have also up there the thermodynamical limit of any ideal device we can think of, our present current technology set by the best operating solar cells at the moment, and also a number of families of portable tech devices which have been moving around in this chart over the last year. Okay? So the message of this chart is important. It says that uh, the same or even a lower final figure of uh, cost per watt peak can be reached from different pairs of cost and efficiency points. Which means, in fact, that if the technology of choice is efficient but expensive, it might be possible to sacrifice a bit of efficiency if, on the other hand, a significant cost reduction is ensured. And this, is, this has been typically the reason why commercial devices were not typically record holders, okay? although these tendencies are changing over the last years. There is actually um, um, just limited room normally to uh, play this game, so uh, reducing significantly uh, the, uh, uh, the euro per watt peak figure normally requires, normally does require a change of technology. And here is where nanotechnology uh, typically enters in the discussion. So any change of technology nowadays towards new concepts typically involves nanotechnology. As a matter of fact, we can put nano stuff in a variety of ways. We can put nano stuff inside our Sources like quantum dot solar cells, quantum well solar cells, or quantum dot sensitized solar cells. We can put nano stuff at the sides uh, in order to improve light management, in order to fabricate hot carrier absorbers or selective contacts for them, or even as a newly uh, freestanding entities like uh, uh, colloidal quantum dot devices, nano wire solar cells, or nano antennae. So that we have a, a, a variety of forms and uh, manners to incorporate nanotechnology in our devices. But before uh, looking for the impact of the entrance of nanotechnology, we first have to review and understand uh, um, our current devices as we understand them. The, the basic question is how much electrical power we can get out of a device when exposed to a certain amount of radiative power. And this part we know fairly well. This is basically the solar uh, spectrum with the different uh, light intensities uh, as a function of wavelengths. This light is shining on our solar cells, and the way uh, these photons from the sun are absorbed in our absorbers in the solar cells depends on the material properties the cell is made of, and particularly on one parameter of the material, which is the background. 
I like this analogy of uh, comparing uh, the bank app and the banner structure of solid with a bookcase uh, containing several shelves of different distance on which we can play the way this works is basically that uh, depending on the value of the bank app, essentially depending on the distance between occupied states and empty states, we can absorb different number of photons generating carriers. And this is a comparison of the small bank app material, and the large or wide bank app material. Uh, in other words, we can generate different amounts of photo current depending on this parameter. But furthermore, uh, each of these carriers, which has been generated with uh, different uh, wavelength photons, generate a carrier which contains a different amount of energy. So if we increase the bank up, typically what happens is that we reduce the number of photo-generated carriers. But on the other hand, each of these carriers has a higher energy content within it. Okay? And this is important because we have to optimize both current and energy content of our carriers. So under ideal conditions, considering the band gap and the temperature as the only factors determining the photo current and the output voltage generation in our devices, we can calculate the optimal value of the band gap and the corresponding maximal efficiency of trainable the load. And this is what Schocke and Quiser perform in his classical calculation. This is represented in this plot when we have uh, the incident light energy in percentage as a function of the band gap of we have a fraction of usable energy, usable energy. But perhaps even more intensely, we have now a, a way to calculate and quantify the optical losses we record in our um, uppermost efficient devices. Okay? So we have a, a way of calculating uh, or to predict the ways we could, in principle, improve our devices beyond the shelf. Here we find ourselves somehow at a crossroads. Uh, from here we can play two different games. We can, on the one hand side, try to improve our devices toward the fundamental chocolate price of it. And this uh, is a uh, topic. Uh, all the current uh, film uh, or wafer base or uh, uh, typical devices is pursuing. But we can also design new concepts uh, aiming at going beyond the chocolate price of living. This has been Name in different ways by generation devices to provide concepts. Nanotechnology is in both, both paths. Okay, so whether we try to improve our devices or we try to go beyond shop devices, it's very likely that nanotechnology will be involved in everything. Approaching shop devices limit is not just an engineering problem, it's actually an active field of research uh, looking for new materials, new technological processes, and a uh, incorporates a large number of exciting and very hot topics like cosmonics, light tracking, light management, perovskites, atomic monolayer junctions, and many more. The important uh, of all these uh, strategies is that uh, there is a large potential impact for seen at industrial scale. So most or, or a large majority of all these topics will very likely end up into improvements in the efficiency of industrially scalable devices. On the other hand, surpassing shock equalizer limit requires a completely different strategy. We can either reshape the absorbing device in order to uh, improve a better matching with the light spectrum. We can do the contrary. We can try to reshape the sunlight spectrum for a better matching with the absorbing device we have. Okay. A number of concepts have been proposed already uh, in both ways. Here you have a list of the, perhaps the most popular of them, like the hot carrier solar cell, multiple exciton generation, intermediate band solar cells, multi junction solar cells, up and down converters, or thermal photovoltaics. There is a huge literature volume on each of these topics, so I will not go into the details of any of them. Okay. But just let me summarize the current situation of these uh, novel concepts. Most of them have uh, seen intensive research, and uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, the proof of concept of the basic operational principles have been tested and, and proved. Okay. Most of them have entered into the device level, so they're somehow operating devices based on 
multiple exciton generation into deep bands, multi junctions, converters, or thermoporovotakes. Perhaps the hot carriers are lagging a little bit behind the rest of them at device level. Uh, if we look at the promise of performing beyond the shock price or limit, nowadays only multi junction concepts have passed the test. It's the only approach so far having already demonstrated performance above the predicted limit. It is now, nevertheless interesting to look beyond that. So um, here I bring just a few examples. Uh, there are many more uh, have, with uh, novel concepts, or perhaps not necessarily novel in a strict sense, but uh, interesting concepts that could help perhaps understanding better uh, new strategies in order to try to surpass the shock price area. Let me just show a few of them. Okay. The first one. Uh, it's actually not that new. It's based on the so-called bulk or anomalous photovoltaic effect. Uh, this uh, effect is shown by a uh, certain type of materials lacking uh, inversion symmetry. Um, and uh, here I show an example based on a ferroelectric material. Ferroelectric material contains nanodomains. So again, we're talking about a strategy using nano stuff inside. This material. And these uh, nanodomains contain four permanent electric dipoles, which result in a band diagram with tilted bands helping carry uh, collection. If you uh, try to manage and align all these domains properly, you end up in a kind of serious connection of little tiny solar cells. Just imagine now you illuminate this material with, with light of appropriate energy in order to use current regeneration. The interesting fact in, in this concept is that due to this internal structure, uh, the voltage, the output voltage of the device is not necessarily limited by the uh, band gap of the material. So in principle, this is a concept that could bring us beyond shock requires a limit, uh, perhaps in a similar fashion as multi-junction uh, dies. Okay. The interesting thing here is that you don't need actually uh, EN junctions or different ways of separating carriers. But on the other hand, this is internally done by the internal structure of the material. So this is certainly uh, one interesting topic in this way to higher efficiency. There are also interesting results concerning uh, light management. Uh, this has, for instance, been demonstrated with nano wire array solar cells, uh, demonstrating very impressive results. Um, here we are dealing with a different kind of phenomena like uh, optical resonances uh, between the structures with, which help absorbing uh, the uh, electromagnetic energy containing the spectrum and raises some questions about the current limitations, at least at a theoretical level, normally employed in the calculations of PVC of devices. So this is a very interesting uh, topic now of research and it will very likely bring us uh, news and improvements in the few coming years. Perhaps also in connection with its nano uh, wire, nano arrays of wires, uh, another interesting concept is that of nano antennae. We're kind of accustomed to employ antennae for radio transmission or television transmission. Uh, the question is antennae can actually absorb and uh, make use of the energy containing electromagnetic waves. However, the difficulty of doing this in the optical range of solar spectrum uh, lies at least in two aspects. One is the dimensions of these structures, which is required in order to deal with these uh, high frequency waves, which brings us again uh, into the nanodome realm of uh, materials. And also uh, an additional difficulty is the necessity for fast rectifying structures which allow to make proper use of the energy of these electromagnetic waves. So this kind of approach is facing some technical challenges, um, but is uh, also being uh, an intensive uh, research topic nowadays. It is interesting to notice that nano antennae is actually present in nature. So nature, at least in uh, in respect of absorbing light as a triggering um, metabolism actually works with 
lots of nanostructures, furthermore, biodegradable nanostructures. But most interestingly, uh, nanoantennae structures are present in photosystems one and two, which are the, uh, the, the primary steps in photosynthetic activities in plants. So uh, making use coherently of energy transfer in resonant uh, structures at the nanoscale is perhaps also an interesting strategy that we could push a little bit farther. Actually, looking at nature can also bring us uh, new ideas. It is also interesting to notice that uh, there's nothing like the injunction uh, uh, here in uh, biology. There are uh, donor acceptor pairs activities. And this was a big success of the dye solar sensitized, dye sensitized solar cell uh, proposal some years ago, just trying to mimic nature somehow the absorption of the solar spectrum. It is also interesting to note that nature normally works with concentration gradients, not necessarily of free carriers, but most of the time with ions, particularly of protons rather than electrons. And there is certainly lots of nanostar, as I said before, in all these uh, bio nano structures. Okay. Just like would like to bring uh, this sentence of Albert St. Giorgi, who was uh, Nobel Prize winner in 1937 for the discovery of vitamin C. In uh, uh, his uh, speech for the Nobel Prize, he said that uh, there is a sense in which living matter engages electromagnetic theory, how it lifts one electron from an electron pair to a higher level, and furthermore, how life has learned to catch the electron in its excited state, and couple it from its partner, and let it drop back to ground state through its biological machinery utilizing its excess energy for life process. Isn't it really similar to what a portable tank device does? I think so. And actually, um, coming now back to the incorporation of nanostat, portable takes as a means to go for this improvement in efficiency. We have to realize, uh, first of all, in one thing. So nanostat is expected to behave as an artificial atom. Okay? And when doing that, the fact is this artificial atom will bring us about discrete levels. And this turns out to be the key issue for understanding the role of nanostructures uh, in solar cells, particularly when considering absorption of light. Okay? There's something similar to the sentence of St. George before. So uh, light is able to promote carriers um, uh, in the absorption process at our nanostructures. We can face the first difficulty when thinking of using nanostructures as light absorbers. And this is uh, what a colleague of mine sentenced uh, very fairly, I think, in the following sentence. Nanostar means nanoions. Okay. In a more sophisticated language, this has a relationship with the Thomas Reich Kuhn Sun rule, which is uh, uh, well known for atomic spectroscopists. But, uh, let me summarize this uh, in the following way. So nanostructure, almost by definition, will deal with just a few electrons, okay? So is this actually the way to go for the terawatt challenge? Uh, we need huge amounts of electrons to do uh, the work in our devices. So playing just with a few of them, isn't it a big problem somehow? Just as, as a reminder, I mean, um, the best per perspectives by the end of this year is that uh, the global cumulative installed PV capacity would be around 300 um, gigawatts, uh, which basically means that we are still lacking like an order of magnitude in order to bring photovoltaic uh, uh, to, to be an important, really important source of electricity. Okay. So coming back to the uh, difficulty of uh, the reduced number of electrons, uh, well, we, we can think, well, uh, we can simply make nanoamps into gigaamps by increasing the number of nanostructures to use. Okay, so just fill up your absorber with nanostar, and the current issue is solved. But uh, in the limit, we already have plenty of nanostar in our devices. Each solid is made of uh, huge amounts of uh, the tiniest possible nanostructure we can think of, which are the atoms. Okay, so why actually bother putting more nanostar? in our absorbers when they already have plenty of them. Okay. Just as an example, we uh, uh, 
have some interest in fabricating um, colloidal quantum dot solar cells made of artificial atoms. What's the advantage of doing this with artificial rather than normal atoms? The answer is this uh, current times voltage issue. Okay? Voltage is an intensive parameter. More stuff doesn't mean simply more voltage. And voltage is actually related with emptiness somehow. I am not too much into Oriental philosophy, but I like very much this sentence by Lao Tse in his book Tao Te Ching. We turn clay to make a vessel, but it is on the space where there is nothing, but the usefulness of the vessel depends. So we actually need two things. We actually need a field state or band, an empty one, and a transit rate between them, which is related with absorption of light and the generation of carriers in hot excited states. But equally important is the relative distance, many units, what we call the band gap, between those field states and the empty ones. Because this distance will actually determine the maximum free energy the device will be able to give us under operating conditions. Okay. And I anticipate here that uh, we will have to cope with some entropic losses terms. In other words, as soon as we talk about free energy, we have to be aware of the second law of thermodynamics at some point. I will come to this point a little bit later. This uh, combination of states, empty and filled, and the distance between them uh, uh, can help us answering the relatively straightforward question, why is it not that easy to make solar cells out of metals? Well, the reason is just because there is no emptiness between donors or field states and acceptors, where everyone is able to match the excited uh, carriers. This somehow would be like a bookcase I mentioned before without shelves, just simply piling up books on top of each other in a rather messy way, uh, not separating them properly. Technically speaking, physicists I uh, like to say that the emptiness between states actually decouples electrons and phonons, which otherwise the electrons will thermalize back very fast, typically in the range of uh, picoseconds, from uh, excited states down to the, to the ground states, releasing just heat before they can do any work uh, in an external circuit, so before we can take profit of this excited state and the high energy content. So if phonon coupling is suppressed, and we do this by increasing the distance between filled and empty states, the only alternative way uh, for the electrons to go back to the ground state is just emitting light instead of heat. Okay? And this is actually inevitable even in the ideal case of the perfect solar cell. This is actually the requirement in order to achieve shock requires electricity. It's somehow, some, somehow paradoxical. So we're basically saying that a good solar cell should admit Lighter well, which seems a little bit weird, okay? But this is actually true. So let me go on with this vessel analogy. We have a density of states, which would be the clay of our vessels, but equally important is to have a gap. Equally important is the empty space. And here we arrive at the formal definition of the density of the states, okay? This density of the states accounts for the number of available states, which helps in the bookcase analogy, per unit volume in an energy. The gap is, by definition, a region of zero density of states, so the distance between available states. And therefore, there is a direct relationship between the maximum output voltage a solar cell can give and the corresponding region of the zero density of states separating empty and field states. That's fine, but what the hell do nanostructures have to do with all this? Well, nanostructures turn out to be like natural candidates in order to play this game. Remember quantum mechanics, uh, uh, the potential world problem in arbitrary number of dimensions? As soon as these dimensions are in the range of the de Broglie wavelength, discrete states show up. Okay, like in the case of a, a hydrogen atom, the simplest case possible, with no accessible states in between. This is the region of zero density of states. It is important to remember that discretization of electronic levels occurs only in certain directions of the space, depending on the dimensionality of the nanostar we're talking about. So it is important to remember that quantum worlds are not confined actually in two dimensions. 
And uh, in the same wise, nano wires are not confined at least in one dimension. So in general, the corresponding density of the states will be superposition of discrete states showing up because of uh, small dimension issues, and a continuous distribution of electronic states in the complementary dimension. So somehow this is a kind of second quantization. So we, we, we started from the atom or molecule level to build up our solids, to pass from bones to bands. This is actually nano taking us back to the atom-like structures. Well, the answer is yes. This is a quick reminder of uh, uh, the simple molecular orbital picture. Uh, we rearrange electronic states into bonding or antibonding branches as soon as we bring together atoms with uh, similar energy states. Just because of Pauli exclusion principle saying that two electrons cannot be at the same time at the same place, the system is forced to reorganize this electronic structure in such a way as to accommodate the equal number of electrons we started with. This is fairly easy to see in, uh, in the case of just two levels, but it's extremely complicated when dealing with things like 10 to the 22 atoms per cubic centimeter, which is the typical density of solid like silicon. So the way this is done in a piece of solid is forming bands. So bands are formed resulting from the uh, rearrangement of those atomic electronic levels. And these bands are actually separated by energy ranges of uh, accessible states for the atoms. These are the band gaps formed between the bands. So we can use this kind of bookcase uh, recipe. We can calculate the bookcase first, the electronic and structural power material, we can calculate the shelf distance and gaps between them. We can start filling up our shelves with books, electrons in our case starting from the bottom up. And we just have to look at the last occupied and the first empty shelves resulting from this arrangement. Okay? This will be our valence, our donor state, and our conduction or acceptor state. And we basically forget about the rest of the shelf, forget about the rest of the bands. Okay? Depending on this relative distance between these states, we classify solids as you know, it's insulators, semiconductors, and metals. We will focus, obviously, in the case of semiconductors, because this is the proper energy range in order to absorb light from the sun through radiation. So basically, we come to this conclusion. It's all about the density of states. The density of state structure determines nearly everything in your semiconductor material. Determines the electronic and magnetic properties. And more important for photovoltaics, determines also the optical properties of particles. So let's focus our attention on the absorption process and the relation with the density of states. Like uh, in all the scattering process, it is all about energy and momentum conservation. And this is better represented in uh, the reciprocal space. So representing energy and momentum in the same chart. This relationship is a material property. It largely depends on the type of atoms and the atomic arrangement of them forming the solid. And the question is how can we represent electronic structures in this funny reciprocal space? Okay, so how we represent our shelves in this funny K space rather than in real conventional space. Well here is an example using a uh, Typical semiconductor gallium arsenide. This is the, the bookshelf picture in the reciprocal space, where each point in these lines represents an available electronic state for the uh, electrons in the salt. Okay. It's a function of position in this reciprocal coordinate um, of crystalline momentum. The advantage of this representation is that it allows us also to incorporate typical energy carriers like photons or phonons in this chart. Each one um, connecting electronic states in different manners, as you know, either as energy containing transitions or momentum containing transitions. So let me focus now in this part of the presentation in, the, in discussing a little bit in a more elaborate way the process of, of absorption, optical absorption, and its direct relation with the density of the states of so, 
I will use a two-level system just for simplicity, as long as it illustrates the basic uh, pieces of work we have to carry out in order to do proper calculation. Okay? So basically, we start with the occupied state, double well as a violent state, and a conjunction state, everyone, separated by a certain energy distance. Okay? Now, we have to use quantum mechanics in order to do all these uh, calculations in the, in the nano real. Okay? So remember that a two-level system in quantum mechanics can be described by uh, Hilbert space in two dimensions. And that a natural basis for this space is actually a set of two states uh, described in the balance and they balance. We need some uh, basic rules for doing quantum mechanical calculations, which basically can be summarized in orthogonality conditions. So these states are orthogonal between them. They form a complete set and all the Hilbert space uh, given dimensions. And we also have a definition of the Hamiltonian of our system, which basically gives us the energy of each of those states. We will need two more pieces for doing calculations, which are the optical polarization and the electric dipole operators. But don't be afraid, we will come to this in a second. So we start with our system, with our two-level system, and we put some, some light of appropriate energy on it, of energy about that of the transition from the occupied to the empty state. We have, therefore, a new Hamiltonian. We have to incorporate the interaction between the electron and the radiation field. Um, just an approximation here uh, is uh, to uh, keep yourself within the limit of the linear optics, which basically means that the material response of, uh, to the external field would be proportional to the field intensity. Okay? We neglect magnetism here just to make things uh, a little bit simpler. So in this approximation, um, the radiation can be described uh, using uh, the polarization of the material. So basically, our perturbation on Newtonian the light matter interaction part of the Hamiltonian will be described with this expression here, just being proportional to the intensity of the uh, electric field, sorry, electromagnetic field, and the polarization of the material. This is the so called and popular dipole approximation, which makes all calculations uh, um, from here much, uh, very much simple, as simple as it could be, at least. Okay? The, um, Polarization is actually defined in terms of the dipole matrix elements, which is even uh, a, a further simplification we can make use of. Let me just briefly justify the uh, approximation of um, keeping ourselves within the linear response regime. Just give me uh, uh, the chance of telling you this example. Uh, the nonlinearity in a conventional semiconductor like that of Mars and I. Uh, only shows up uh, when shining the material with intensities as high as uh, gigasats. Okay, so if we compare this with the maximum the, uh, theoretical concentration we can uh, utilize for photovoltaic conversion of uh, some 46,000 sun. This clearly says that our approximation is kind of well based, so we are on the safe side using the linear approximation. Okay, okay. so. We will make use of this dipole matrix element. So basically, what we have to do is to apply this dipole operator defined in this way, just the charge of our carrier times uh, the position of it. And just applying this operator on our basis states, we actually can define all possible transitions to be expected in our two level system. Connecting states of the same type, either valence or conduction state, will lead us to intraband transitions. Connecting uh, conduction and valence states, on the other hand, will bring about interband transitions. So we're basically covering all possibilities of making these states talking to each other. Okay. Of course, we we'll probably have to apply some symmetry rules. Some of those transitions might be forbidden for fundamental reasons. Um, we have to keep in mind a few uh, concepts here that will simplify even further 
all these possible combinations. But in principle, we have covered all the possibilities we can think of. From this state, it's kind of straightforward to extend the two-level uh, system to a few-level uh, system, or a system which contains degenerate states. So we can, for instance, think of a system containing a number of occupied states, a number of empty states. We basically have to apply the same recipe described before, just counting all possible combination between states. Okay, but uh, the recipe is the same. The difficulty is that we have to cope now with a, a slightly more difficult, higher dimensional Hilbert space. We have to bring about other states to our calculations. But basically the material Hamiltonian is defined the same way. This is still giving out the energy of each of those possible states we do. We again can put some light uh, into our system. We will have to correct our Hamiltonian, just accounting for this perturbation of the light matter interaction. But we basically will use the same approximation we made before. So we're in the range of linear optics. Our Perturbation Hamiltonian is uh, linearly proportional to the intensity of the field. And again, the polarization vector plays a role through the matrix, the uh, electric dipole matrix elements of the different combinations between states. So doing that and just focusing now on the interband transitions, we can define our absorption processes. So transitions bringing us from lower states to empty states but we can also equally well define um, the emission processes. So again, our methodology permits to perform all possible calculations we can think of in our system, okay? So as long as the uh, dipole matrix element is a measure of how easily the initial and final states are coupled by light, in other words, how they talk to each other whenever light is in between, we can call the matrix element the oscillator strength. So how strong this transition from one occupied state to one empty state is expected to be, okay? Perhaps with some numerical perfections. There is an important closure relation here that I, I would like to, to, to state a little bit uh, clear. Um, consider the case of a single electron. We start with a single electron at an occupied level and we operate a number of empty states above. The oscillator strength measures the likelihood with which the electron would end up into each of these different available states as a result of light illumination. Okay? So under steady state conditions, if we shine light with a proper amount of energy, we know for sure that the electron will actually end up into an excited state at some point. Okay? As a matter of fact, if we have a number of possible ending states, it turns out that we have to share this probability of unity among all these possible end states, okay? This is the famous Thomas Weichekun sum rule I mentioned before, which basically says that if we have one electron available to make transitions and we do the things properly, the probability of ending up with a transition will be one. So this electron will certainly make the change. We can extend this for an arbitrary number of electrons. We have C a number of electrons. We could expect C transitions as a result of illumination. The interesting point here is that if we target one specific end state among all possible states, we have to take into account that the probability of ending up there at our target state will certainly not be one, but will be less, okay? simply because of the fact that we have other possible ending states that we have to take into account in our calculation. This is, for instance, important when thinking of transitions without quantum dots. Quantum dots contain typically a number of discrete states available as excited states, but also a continuum range of electronic states at sufficiently high energies. So if we are illuminating our quantum dot white light containing all possible energies, we have to count the possibility of ending up at different states uh, than the one we are targeting for, okay? This is the importance of this closure relation, 
tone of the sound rule. So from here, we can extend in a relatively easy manner our protocol to do calculations to continue. Basically, what we say now is that we can uh, describe bands instead of discrete states using the same procedure we just mentioned before. Uh, we transform sums into integrals, which we normally do in continua, and we transform our discrete state into delocalized states well described by uh, block electrons or block wave functions. As a consequence of this, we have to deal now not with delta-like operators anymore, but with smear quantities over a wider uh, range of energies. Okay. But this has an advantage, which uh, is that uh, it simplifies uh, tremendously all possible calculations. So if we are interested in transition rates between occupied and empty states, what we have to do <coughs> is to integrate over time uh, basically the calculation of the dipole matrix we were mentioning before. Now expressed in a slightly different way. We can express our initial state with the block electron at the balance band, we can uh, define our end state as another block electron at the convention band. And we can introduce the light coupling by the electromagnetic field as a plane wave, for instance, just to make life easier. Okay? So the rate will be proportional to a set of delta functions, which will be different from zero on the certain specific transitions, which will be the ones that the photons actually permit. Okay? Furthermore, we have to extend this integral also to a volume. And remember, we are still in this funny reciprocal space. So we have to extend this summation to all possible combinations of different crystalline momentum states. Okay? So our final recombination, sorry, our, our final uh, transition rate will be proportional to the sum of all these possible combinations between states as allowed by the energy contained in our photons. And this is finally the definition of the joint density of states. This is the key parameter controlling our transition rates in all absorption processes between states, whether they are discrete or belong to a continuum. Okay? So we can try to calculate this joint density of states. It turns out, as usual, that integration is easier for some funny reason than simply some things. Uh, we can transform our sum into an integral. And uh, in doing that, we also have an advantage, which is that we can transform this volume integral into a surface integral just by uh, simple calculus rules. So basically, the problem can be stated in this way. We can calculate, we can simply count how many states we incorporate if we extend an iso-energy surface as a function of k vectors, just extending a little bit more this k vector uh, the upper limit of this k vector a little bit far. Okay, so how many states are incorporated in coming from this small volume here to a slightly larger volume out there? Okay. So after all this math, sorry about this, um, we end up with this expression for the joint density of the states, which is really interesting, as I will be showing you in a second. We have said that the transition rate is proportional to the joint density of the states. And it turns out that the joint density of states is proportional to a factor which looks like this. Okay? The key point here is that this factor diverges from the derivative in the denominator goes to zero. In other words, we have maximum probability of transition in response to light absorption at those particular points in the electronic structure which satisfy uh, this condition. These are the so-called critical points in the electronic structure. And they, they, they can be described in a rather simple way. So critical points will feel that the slope of the occupied state is equal to the slope of the uh, unoccupied state. Remember, we're still in the reciprocal space. So we are defining energy as a function of momentum. But if you remember this picture of the electronic state of Kali Marcenac, it means that optical transition will be most likely to happen whenever the, band, uh, the bands involved in the transition are parallel. And this will only occur at certain points 
in the reciprocal space. In other words, at certain values of the k vectors. Okay. There is a particularly interesting case, which is whenever these slopes are not only parallel but also horizontal. So when each of these slopes is zero. Okay. So these are very important uh, points defining the electronic structure in our tubes. Actually, we can elaborate a little bit further from here. Uh, critical points will behave differently depending on, on their type. And in order to uh, simplify this discussion, let me remember that we can, in principle, make uh, uh, approximations at, around these critical points, which basically could mean that we can simply take a power series and expand this relationship as a, a number of polynomials. Okay? Just keeping the first known vanishing um, term here, remember that this um, slope is zero at the critical point, so we're just expanding around the point when this term is zero. We're left with this conventional and well-known parabolic approximation. So we can, to a good degree of accuracy, uh, simplify our very complex electronic structure around critical points using this parabolic band approximation, which simply means to make an expansion of this electronic structure and keeping only the quadratic term of it. Okay. The interesting thing now is that we are not only left out with paraboloids or paraboloid-like structures, but actually different shapes as a function of the different signs these coefficients in the expansion will, uh, will take. So, for instance, in three dimensions, we might expect up to four different types of critical points, depending on the signs of each of these alpha coefficients in the expansion. All of them are positive. We are left with this topology in our critical point, which resembles uh, what we typically approximate uh, for our conduction bands, bottoms. We have uh, two types of saddle points, depending on mixing plus and minus signs in these coefficients. And we can also have a, a all negative combination of uh, coefficients, which are very useful for defining upper band edge, like in the case of a balance band. Just um, doing the same for two dimensions, uh, just reducing the number of coefficients we have to cope with. We recover our topology for uh, critical points. This is the typical density of states expected, for instance, for quantum wells for uh, um, one dimensional confinement. Okay, just uh, the independent independency of the joint density of states as a function of the energy. But we also have saddle points uh, possible in our structure, which would be a combination of one plus and one minus sign of this coefficient. <clears throat> Doing the same in one or in zero dimensional structure brings us again the familiar uh, morphology of the density of the states expected for these structures. So in other words, we have mapped all possible types of critical points and the joint density of the states. Really. So let me recap now uh, for a second. We have seen that the transition rate between occupied and empty states is proportional to the joint density of states, and we have defined that parameter. Okay. Now the photon energy absorbed in a material when shining light on it per unit time and volume is equivalent to the power dissipation uh, suffered by the electromagnetic wave as it crosses the material. So we can uh, uh, set up this equality saying that the product of the energy times the transition rate is equal to the power loss or the energy loss of the electromagnetic wave as it travels inside the material. And of course, this power loss is related with the absorption coefficient of our material, or in a more elaborated way, with the imaginary part of the dielectric constant. This is a material property. Okay. So we have a direct relationship between the absorption coefficient of the dielectric constant in our material and the joint density of states. These two parameters are connected through this transition rate probability. Okay. So we can actually translate the map we made for the density of the state into a qualitative map showing us the morphology of the expected dielectric function or the absorption coefficient in our material. So we have a similar plot now for dielectric constants instead of joint density of state, 
And the advantage now is that the dielectric constant is typically an experimentally accessible parameter, not that easy to obtain uh, as a function of the density of the state. Okay. Interestingly, there are a few experimental uh, characterization techniques which uh, permit uh, access to uh, sorption coefficient and dielectric constants, for instance, uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry. And uh, one technique that I find particularly interesting is modulation and spectroscopy in different manners, like photo, or pieto, or thermal reflectance. In this technique, basically, what we're doing is to modulate the electronic structure around critical points by means of a certain perturbation agent. Okay, so we're basically changing in a slight manner the density of the states and therefore the dielectric constant in our materials, and we can uh, actually monitor and do a spectroscopy as a result of this tiny modification. Depending on the type of perturbation we introduce, we can have different shapes in our spectroscopy. We can expect different behaviors. Okay? But this is well documented and well elaborated. So we have means to determine the nature of critical points experimentally. We can determine whether we are dealing with uh, different dimensionality in our critical points. And perhaps even more interesting, we can uh, tell something about the fact of having electronic, electronic confinement in some of those critical point structures. So we have a very powerful way of characterizing nanostructures and bulk materials. Let me show you just a quick example of this. This is a photoreflectance spectrum performed on a quantum dot uh, solar cell by self-assembling in the marginalite quantum dots in a dynamarsonite matrix. And we have uh, our spectroscopy signatures for all the available states related with our nanostructures inside our photovoltaic devices. And from this, we can determine whether we have uh, a higher dimensionality in our critical points or whether there is actually electronic confinement at those states. So it's a very powerful thing. I think I'm running out of time, but just let me uh, say a couple of words about a, another important factor the density of the states is related with when dealing with photovoltaics. So we have uh, talked so far about absorption. This is somehow related with photocurrent and current generation in our devices. Let me just now uh, mention a few words uh, related with the generation of voltage or free energy in a photovoltaic device and how nanostructures could help improving also voltage figures in photovoltaic devices. For this, um, let me just describe um, the solar cell as a, basically as a thermodynamic uh, machine. We have a system which is able to provide some free energy, uh, described with this uh, delta mu here, as a function of the energy input, which is not only energy, which is also entropy, a certain, uh, a certain temperature and with a certain solid angle of incidence, which is the solar radiation we shine light with into our absorbers. And uh, as in any uh, thermal engine, this engine, which is providing us some electrical work in this case, will also release some waste okay, in the form of energy and entropy at a certain temperature and so on. With this simple picture, we can anticipate that the best we can do in this case is a situation in which there is no net increase in entropy inside the machine. Basically, all the entropy that is entering uh, with the radiation is leaving the, the, the device. And also, the best situation is such that the uh, solid angles of absorption and emission are equal. In this way, we can expect maximum efficiency. In fact, the maximum efficiency in this case is nothing different from uh, the ideal thermal engine, which is well described by this Carnot uh, term. And this is basically the best we could expect from our photovoltaic device. Okay. Unfortunately, we normally have to include a large variety of entropic terms in this calculation. So we have um, entropy generation, we cannot simply reject the uh, entropic content of a black body radiation. Uh, but we have to cope with 
uh, a number of losses we have to incorporate into any kind of realistic calculation of the free energy available for our device. And this uh, includes a number of issues like uh, solid angle mismatch between emission and absorption. The incomplete uh, light absorption our device will suffer anyway. The mismatch between absorption and luminescence, uh, which also reduces the available free energy by increasing an entropic term. A number of them, but uh, let me just focus on one entropic loss term, which is directly connected with the density of states we're discussing in this center. Okay? And let me just illustrate this in a simple cartoon here. Imagine we have a, a solid, which could be a nanostructure or a piece of um, a chunk of, of, of bulk semiconductor. We have a, a valence band state with a number of electrons described with these blue mm -hmm. holes here. A number of holes described with these squares. And a number of excited states uh, on, a, let's say, a thermal range uh, of some trait dt um, at the conduction band. Okay? Thinking about entropy in this system, we are left with a rather simple problem of calculating how many ways we have to distribute balls in empty boxes um, in, in this situation. Okay? So just simply due to the fact that we have a certain dilution of carriers in our density of states, we will um, incur in an entropic term that we have to take care of when doing calculations of available free energy in our photovoltaic device. Now we can try to reduce this uh, entropic term by reducing the dilution, or in other words, increasing the concentration of our carriers into our available states. Well, one simple way would be to reduce the number of states available here and force the same number of carriers to occupy in a more orderly way those available states. Okay? We can even go further and try to tailor appropriately uh, in a very clever way the available states for our carriers in such a way as to minimize the disorder expected to be uh, present in our nanostructures. Okay? But the interesting point here is to say that as long as we can tailor, we can play with the structure of the density of the states in whatever nanostructure we can think of to incorporate in our solar cells, to some degree we might also be able to play with the distribution of the states and the entropic term related with it. This is simply an entropic term related with the availability of the states and the number of carriers we have to cope with. Okay? This is expressed in this bottom expression here which we can uh, approximate fairly well in conventional, uh, it's conventionally done in semiconductors, making use of the effective mass approximation. Okay? So we can have a, a kind of first hint that the entropic term we, are, we will be incurring and when calculating voltage in our devices, if we uh, look at the effective masses our carriers actually show in our structure. Yeah, this is a, a relatively simple model. By the way, I think there is a missing factor of two down here. Maybe it's not too important. Okay. But this has a, a, a consequence that we can directly um, uh, see experimentally uh, in, in conventional solids. Okay? The fact that uh, a difference in the effective mass of the carriers will bring us to different entropic losses when calculating achievable voltages out of our devices. If we compare the uh, energy dispersion relationship of free carriers with the ones we have inside any solid, and particularly I will focus here in conventional semiconductors with four, three, five, to six families, it normally happens that the effective masses of the electrons in the conduction band is slightly lower than the free electron mass uh, we have. Okay? And this would be good news in the sense that uh, the dispersion would be more concentrated. Okay? We don't have that many available states within the first KPs uh, above the valence band edge. Okay? Regarding holes, we are also not in a very bad situation because uh, even though the effective mass of holes in these semiconductors are normally slightly higher than free electron mass, it, it, the difference is usually not that big. 
When comparing these, for instance, with metal oxides, which have also uh, uh, a lot of interest as photovoltaic materials, we can anticipate that we'll be incurring in higher entropic losses simply due to the fact that normally effective masses, both for electrons and holes in these materials, are typically higher than free electron masses. So, in other words, we could not, in principle, prevent this problem of diluting a reduced number of carriers in our available states. And this will be punished in our voltage calculations simply by this entropic uh, kind of discussion. So, in the ideal case, we will, uh, we have the chance, we will prefer to tailor and shape our dielectronic state structure in a kind of funnel. Um, which naturally would tend to concentrate our generated precarious by the absorption processes we were discussing some minutes ago. Okay? And this is all an advantage of nanostructures. As long as we can tailor our density of state structure, we can aim at obtaining electronic structures which resemble these final like structures. With this, I'm coming to an end. Um, just a few concluding remarks. We started asking ourselves why and how nanotechnology is seen as a promising path for photovoltaics. The reason why is that it uh, opens the possibility uh, of improving efficiency and reducing production costs at uh, larger scales. And the way this could be done is related with this principle of electronic structure. It's related with the simple concept of density of the state, which is not easily accessible experimentally, but we have seen that we have also some means of um, not only seeing it, but also adjusting them when fabricating our nanostructures. Okay? I have illustrated this, uh, paying some attention to absorption processes, and the kind of formal discussion of how to calculate these processes, and also illustrated this in a very concrete example of the entropic losses associated with the density of the state nature of our sections. Okay? And with this, I thank you for your attention, and um, I will be happy to try to answer the questions you might pose now. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. It was a really nice uh,